Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight. And my name is Miles Sheehan. I'm the director of the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics, as well as the Lawler Chair in Catholic Health Care Ethics and a professor of medicine here. And as you can see from my collar, it's not Halloween. I'm also a Jesuit priest here at Georgetown. Welcome both of those who are here from Georgetown, but especially for our guests from outside the university. We're here for our doctors gave the orders 75 years after the Nuremberg Medical Trial Conference. The Pellegrino Center is honored to co-sponsor this very important event, but I would be remiss if I didn't say the driving forces, Dr. Dan Solmazy from the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. Without Dan, this would not have happened, so thank you for all of that. I have to give one word of apologizing um, so I don't set back uh, Jewish-Christian relations by another 50 years. I have to go teach right after this, so I'm going to introduce and then I'm going to leave, and so I apologize for that. It gives me great pleasure first to introduce you to to my boss, Dr. Ed Hilton. Dr. Hilton is the Executive President for Health Sciences and Executive Dean of the School of Medicine, as well as a Professor of Neurology. And we're all very grateful for Dr. Hilton to be able to take time out of his extraordinarily busy schedule to welcome you to the Medical Center. Dr. Hilton. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was very important function, and I know you have to go now. Uh, no one can be Miles' boss, really, but I appreciate the, the introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to all of you uh, with us here at Georgetown. And I also want to welcome the several hundred, I think it's up to 800 now, uh, colleagues who are joining us via Zoom. So um, it's really uh, an important uh, you know, opportunity for all of us to gather. Uh, for this incredibly important uh, symposium tonight and, and during the course of the day tomorrow. And as we mark the 70, uh, this year, the 75th anniversary of the Nuremberg Medical Trial and reflect on its connection to present day research and clinical care, we're doing so at a most difficult time in our country, as I think we all know, as we continue to witness a rise in anti-Semitic incidents throughout the United States. Uh, it's hard for us to fathom how it could be possible that doctors could make the decisions they did to harm, maim, and actually kill people because of their race or because of their psychiatric, neurological, or physical disabilities. But we continue to see hate in our midst. I'd like to pause for a moment for that reason and affirm that our Georgetown community stands in solidarity with our Jewish friends and colleagues we stand against acts of hate and against, uh, against any group. Anti-Semitism isn't just happening somewhere else, it's happening in our neighborhoods here in DC. And so that's one reason why it's important for Georgetown to convene symposiums like the one we're gathered here for tonight. Through continued education, reflection, and dialogue, we hope to foster a more inclusive culture of acceptance and belonging. I'm very pleased to welcome Rabbi Professor Steinberg here tonight. Had a chance to chat and, and meet Professor Steinberg. And I'm grateful to Dan Somacy, director of our Kennedy Institute of Ethics, and Miles Sheen, director of our Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics, uh, for organizing this important discussion tonight. I understand, Professor Steinberg, that you were here and met uh, Dr. Pellegrino some uh, 25 years ago, I believe. So it's wonderful to have this uh, come full circle. As many of you may know, Georgetown has been a leader in the field of ethics, and now is at a significant turning point in our work as we launch our new Emergent Ethics Network, designed to explore modern-day ethical challenges from a variety of perspectives that are inextricably intertwined and yet so very practical in our everyday world. Obviously, we find many ethical issues in medicine, but there are so many way areas that require ethical management and, and analysis as they deeply impact our culture. Just think about how the environment impacts the health of people around the world or consider the dual role of technology in our society, the good that it can do, but also the uh, unleashing harm if left unchecked. So there's lots of uh, areas that we need to, to across many domains that our uh, ethics um, network will, will focus on. As a Jewish institution devoted to the greater good, and with our well-established programs in ethics, Georgetown and its Emergent Ethics Network 
uh, is wonderfully positioned <clears throat> to grapple with the practical ethical issues that affect us all. Uh, and we're grateful to Dan and Miles for truly forging this important and unique net, uh, network. And with that, I just want to, that sort of advertisement, I'll have to admit, but it's an important uh, new initiative. Thank you again for being here tonight uh, with us. And I hope you'll also come back tomorrow for the second part of the symposium. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Ed, for uh, welcoming us and hosting us here in the Medical Center. Um, welcome to all of you here assembled and those on uh, Zoom who are joining us for this symposium. Um, I'd like to um, thank uh, Centile and the Center for Medicine uh, after the Holocaust for their support um, for this program. Primary support for the program um, has come from several funds at the Kennedy Institute, the Edmund Pellegrino and Andre Helliger's uh, lecture uh, funds, um, but importantly from the uh, Isaac Frank Memorial uh, Lectureship. Isaac Frank was a senior research scholar at the Kennedy Institute and a lecturer in philosophy at Howard and at Catholic University before coming to Georgetown in 1979. Um, he emigrated uh, from the Ukraine in the face of pogroms um, in 1923, um, obtained a PhD in philosophy and sociology at the University of Maryland, um, and is best known in the Washington community because he was the executive vice president of the Jewish Community Council of Greater Washington for 25 years. Um, his uh, daughter, uh, Phyllis, um, uh, regrets that she can't be here to join us uh, uh, tonight due to illness in the family. Um, will be joining us um, on Zoom, a part of the wonders of the technology. Um, uh, but she wanted me to note especially two important characteristics of her dad. Um, one uh, is his love of logic, um, and the other is his optimism. Um, um, I'd like to think that these are characteristics that will be reflected in our scholars at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics and the Pellegrino Center today. Um, I think they've been um, previously um, uh, demonstrated by some of the distinguished lecturers in the Isaac Frank Memorial Lecture Series, including luminaries like Arthur Kaplan, uh, David Novak, uh, J. David Blake. Uh, and also our lecturer this evening, um, who will add, um, I think, great luster to our series. Uh, Rabbi Professor uh, Avraham Steinberg um, studied in the Rabbinic Academy of Yeshivat Harav Kuk um, in Jerusalem and studied uh, medicine at the Hebrew uh, University Hadassah School, uh, Medical School in Jerusalem. He was a resident in the Department of Pediatrics uh, at Sha'are Zedek um, and the Department of uh, Pediatric Neurology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center, after which he became a fellow in that same department. Uh, he served as attending physician in Sha'are Zedek uh, Medical Center and Bikur Sholim uh, Hospital in Jerusalem and currently works as a physician in pediatric neurology. Uh, he is director of the Medical Ethics Unit and chair of the IRB in the Shah Zedek Medical Center. Um, he co-chaired the Israeli National Bioethics Council and currently chairs several committees, including the National Committee in Accordance with the Dying Patient Act and the board of the Mohalim uh, um, of the Chief Rebbenate of Israel. Professor Steinberg has received a variety of prizes and awards, among them the Israel Prize in 1999 for his Encyclopedia of Jewish Medical Ethics, uh, which I think we all know um, eclipsed that of Jacobowitz as the definitive international source book in that field. It's been translated into English by uh, Fred Rosner, and a copy of the English version at least is available in our uh, bioethics library. Um, he is the author of various books and several hundred articles on Jewish medical ethics, general medical ethics, and the history of medicine and pediatric neurology. He is currently editing the Talmudic Encyclopedia, which was begun in the 1940s. Uh, 
And on a personal note, um, I've had the pleasure of meeting Rabbi Steinberg at a number of conferences um, and would uh, note that he was appointed by Pope Francis as one of the several interfaith members of the Pontifical Academy uh, for Life, uh, the Vatican's Bioethics Commission, in which uh, I also serve. Uh, you will find, I think, that uh, Rabbi Professor Steinberg, like Isaac Frank, does combine logic um, and optimism. Um, he is both erudite and down-to-earth, penetrating and gentle, a good rabbi and a good physician. Um, please give a warm welcome to Rabbi Steinberg, who will open our symposium commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Nuremberg Medical Trials by speaking on the relevance of medicine during the Third Reich to contemporary medicine. Thank you very much uh, for your very warm introduction, and it's really a great pleasure and honor for me to address you here at uh, Georgetown University. As mentioned, uh, I was here about 25 years ago at a sym symposium that Dr. Pellegrino organized, and it was published as a book, Jewish and Catholic Bioethics. Uh, each of us contributed uh, articles in, the, in this book, and it's really a great pleasure and honor to come back to Georgetown for this occasion. And I want to appreciate the initiation of this very important symposium on such a tragic event, but still it is something that happened and it is important to discuss it from various aspects. Some of them will be discussed through this uh, symposium I also want to thank my dear colleague, uh, Shelley Rubenfeld. I understand he is part of the organizing committee, and Professor Haramati, who is a new friend that I acquired through this symposium. I'm very proud and happy uh, to acknowledge it. Thank you very much. You can have, uh, yeah. So, uh, when we talk about Nazi physicians, uh, the, the light is so <laughs> hard to, to look. Uh, it is interesting and tragic to, to state that the German medical profession, even before the beginning of World War II, was committed to the Nazi ideology. Uh, about 45% of German physicians were members of the Nazi party more than any other profession. The percentage of physicians participating as active members in the Nazi ideology was greater than engineers or teachers or any other profession. They had this ideology. It, I'm not sure that we know the explanation for this fact, but that is a number that I think is worthwhile to remember. Also, they already did some uh, uh, atrocities as if a medical uh, procedure prior to uh, World War II just on uh, preserving the race, the German race, by uh, killing and preventing the birth of defective children. We also know that they were uh, very active in sterilizing mentally deficient Germans, not Jews and not uh, uh, gypsies. They did it to their own uh, fellow uh, citizens in order to maintain the cl cleanliness of the German race. Active euthanasia of handicapped and other defective people, again, uh, the T4 uh, project, which was a terrible uh, incident. And unfortunately, from my point of view, active euthanasia, not in the form of the Nazis, but still ideologically, there are some countries 
who promote it and some countries that legalize it personally I think that is a mistake, but I'm not comparing them, I'm just uh, shedding a light of what happened then. During World War II, those physicians participated in the final solution of inferior races, particularly Jews, that is well known, and I'll go over some of the experiments, uh, quote unquote, that they did in order to uh, promote some of their ideologies. They also killed psychiatric patients. They also killed uh, homosexuals. There was really a, a terrible uh, understanding of what a human being is. A human being is only if he belongs to the Ari uh, race and everyone else has to disappear. The cruel experiments that they did, especially in concentration camps, are the topic of our discussion today. And we are talking about 7,000 people who were coerced into involuntary recorded studies. There are many more that were not recorded, despite the fact that they were Germans and they were very strict on methodology and of uh, documentation. We know that they were many experiments that were never recorded, and the numbers are certainly beyond the 7,000 known and recorded uh, people who underwent uh, involuntary experimentation. So we are now commemorating the Nuremberg trial, and 23 Nazi physicians were tried, 16 were found guilty, seven of whom were executed in 1948, and others were sentenced to long prison terms. So it is a minority of the group of physicians, but they were the leading physicians who did the terrible experiments, and they were finally sentenced. So what type of medical experimentations did these uh, physicians do. So there were some experiments that were intended to save Nazi pilots and help German military personnel in combat. Others were for pure medical purposes, treating infections and others. I'll give a few examples. They were ideological experiments, which being physicians, we, we just can't understand what what idea was behind it? Uh, usually nowadays when we do an experiment, we have to explain what is the rationale? Why do we do this experiment? Wh what is the rationale to do it? And here we are talking about an experiment that makes no sense at all from a scientific point of view, yet they were engaged in it very heavily. And there were experiments on mass sterilization in order to prevent the birth of either fellow Germans who were not uh, perfect or certainly uh, other uh, nations that they felt were inferior. They did their experiments terribly uh, painful without any anesthesia. Many of the uh, subjects died during the experimentations and others suffered physical and emotional trauma, disfigurement, and permanent disability, and those who survived are carrying with them this uh, terrible trauma to this day. So what were some of the experiments to help save Nazi pilots? The idea was that if a pilot falls into the ocean, the waters are cold, how long will they survive, meaning how long should they uh, spend money and efforts to try to find the pilot and save his life? If it is beyond a certain uh, point of time in freezing water, he probably wouldn't survive. So how long is it that it's worthwhile looking after him? So in order to, uh, to experiment this period of time, there were some experiments done in Dachau by some of the doctors who were uh, subsequently trialed on high altitude with low oxygen tension, 
they took prisoners in a very high atmospheric pressures uh, and nearly half of the prisoners di died during the experiment. Other doctors tried to do it in hypothermic studies, meaning they put uh, prisoners, many of them were Jewish, some were prisoners of war from other nations, and they put them in freezing cold water or exposed them to the snowy weather uh, in the winter, and they looked to see how long it took for these uh, unfortunate people to die in this terrible condition. At some point, the screams of pain were so terrible that it led Nazis to stop the experiment. So we, we can imagine how much suffering it entailed that even the Nazis felt that it's already too much and they stopped this experiment. About 44 prisoners were thrown into tubs of water with a very high salt or other chemical contents. Again, looking how long it will take for them to die, how long would it be worthwhile to put efforts to save a pilot who fell into very salty waters. The experiments that were designed for medical purposes were uh, also varied. Uh, some were done to uh, test the uh, effectivity, the effectiveness of the sulfonamide, which was one of the first antibiotics invented. And in World War II, obviously, like in any war, there were many soldiers who got injured and infected, and they tried to uh, give them a medication that would fight the infection. And what they did it, they made people wounded and infected and gave them the sulfonamide to see if it really is uh, beneficial, which again, it, they didn't know dosages, they didn't know how to give it. It was all in a very uh, beginning of experiments. And again, many of these people either died or uh, were permanently disabled. Other uh, experiments were to uh, obtain organs or bones from live prisoners in order to implant it to Germans who lost a leg or, or an arm and using this as, a, uh, as an organ uh, donation from a live person who was maimed in such a terrible way. They, injected pus into prisoners to study the effect of various chemicals, and many of them uh, died. So there were a whole host of uh, chemical and infectious uh, diseases that they uh, introduced into the prisoners, and just to see what the natural cause of it is, or what kind of treatment can be done, and whether it can be helpful or not. A big uh, a number, uh, a large number of prisoners were infected with typhus to test uh, the efficacy of a vaccine that they uh, tried to uh, promote, and that vaccine didn't work, and patients uh, died of the infection that they introduced into them of uh, typhus. Now, this really is something that, as I said earlier, seems to be uh, very uh, unusual for a physician even to think about it. And that is, what were the ideological experiments to preserve the Aryan race, or on the other hand, to reject others? So we all are aware of the twin uh, experiments that were done by Joseph Mengele in Auschwitz. He supposed that if he'll know the mechanism why certain uh, women deliver twins, he can introduce it to German women and they'll get many more Germans in, in, at the same time. Rather than get one child, they'll get immediately two or three, and that will increase the number of uh, the German people, but he did terrible things with the twins. 
some he killed and did a post-mortem exam to, to look why they were born as twins. Others he just studied in, in different ways. Other experiments were to look into the uh, anthropology of the skeleton of uh, non-German versus German people to show that there is a real difference, a, a, a scientific, biological difference between Aryans and non-Aryans by the way the anthropology of the skeleton is built. And again, obviously, it didn't make any sense, and it just caused uh, terrible suffering. The other uh, big uh, experiment that they did was to, to do mass sterilizations, and they looked for, for methods that they could use in masses so that they will at once sterilize many people rather than going from one to another, radiation, uh, chemicals uh, injected into the uterus, and many other such terrible experiments in order to reduce the number of non aryan So that was the a comparison between experiments to increase the Aryan race versus experiments to reduce other populations. Now the question is both medical and ethical. From a medical point of view, what was the outcome of so many experiments? Supposedly, there were scientific experiments with a methodology and even recorded and written. What came out, out of it? So there were, obviously, most of the experiments didn't lead to any outcome that can be reproduced, uh, and it's useless for future generations. At some point, there were studies that showed some uh, efficacy of outcome in the hypothermic uh, uh, experiments, but that subsequently was proved that it didn't really add much, and therefore the medical outcome was almost zero from all these terrible experiments. Nothing was learned from it, and nothing could be applied for uh, after the, uh, the experiments were done. The ethical question is, if something would have been beneficial for future uh, time, are we allowed ethically to make use of the outcome of something that was achieved in such an unethical way? And that actually is a question less important for the German Nazi physicians because, as I said, medically, anyway, there was no, nothing to deal with. But as an ethical question, it appears to be relevant to other experiments that have been done, not, not by the Germans, and earlier and even later, after World War II, in this country and in many other uh, Western civilized countries, not Nazi ideology, ideology, and yet there were outcomes that are worth putting into. One example is a yellow fever vaccination that was done almost in, in Nazi ways of experiment, and it is beneficial. And we all who go to endemic areas of yellow fever take the vaccine, and we don't think about it, that actually this vaccine was produced in a terrible, unethical way, almost similar to that. We know the Tuskegee uh, experiments. We know other uh, events that happened after World War II in civilized countries, and yet we are using the outcomes despite the fact that they were done in an unethical way. So the argument against using it is double. One is we don't want to use something that was done in an unethical way. As a principle, this is unethical, and therefore we shouldn't use it. Another argument is that by using it, we might encourage 
encourage people to do research which will be unethical because if they see that at the end we use and we get famous that we did something that the world is using, maybe we can uh, shortcut uh, all the limitations that uh, ethical experiments should be conducted. The other side of the coin is that yes, it was done unethically, but maybe it is unethical not to use it in order to save people. So where do we cross the line? So from a Jewish point of view, and I don't want to talk about the Nazis because actually nothing happened, but from a Jewish point of view, there's an interesting distinction between a sin that is being committed that has good outcome from a religious point of view, from a practical point of view, it doesn't matter now what the outcome uh, we are looking at, but the distinction is between an act that was done unethical or unlegal, but the act which was un uh, illegal finished. The, the illegality has passed. Now we are left with the outcome. Here, the uh, Jewish approach is to use it in order to benefit others. Whereas if the sin or the unethical conduct is continuing, it didn't finish yet, and we are using it in order even to benefit someone else, that is using the unethical process that is still ongoing and that is forbidden to do. So that, I think, is a distinction that makes sense. And if we're talking about the yellow fever uh, development of vaccine, it was done unethically, but that was finished. And now we have a result that can save many lives, so we are allowed ethically to use it. So the dilemma regarding the Nazi experiments, we were saved from because it didn't yield any outcome. So, so the question is theoretical, but it has ramifications to other experiments that might have been uh, beneficial and yet the wrongdoing was finished, and now we have something that can save lives. So at least from a Jewish point of view, it is acceptable. It is debatable, and I'm not saying that everyone agrees to it from both uh, secular ethics and even within uh, Jewish uh, uh, ethicists. Not everyone agrees with it, but I, I think it's an idea that uh, we should think about it. What else came out of the uh, terrible experiments was the Nuremberg Code, which once we understood what happened and how the experiments were conducted, and we don't want it to repeat itself ever again, a code was written how to do an experiment, which subsequently evolved into the Helsinki Declaration which is being revised again and again, and currently there is a committee by the WHO that is trying to revise even further the uh, Helsinki Declaration revised format. And why did it happen so? Because until World War II, there were hardly any experiments in the way that we know them today. Usually in since Hippocrates and, and on, uh, medicine evolved anecdotally. A physician thought about an idea, tried it on a patient, it worked, he tried it on another patient, then he told his friend, and that's how things evolved. There were never experiments in the sense that we know today that we proactively do something to a group of people, certainly now double blind, and all these are new ways to experiment in, in human history. And the ones that actually did it almost for the first time in such a mass scale were the German Nazis, physicians. So once such a mode of experimenting came into being, 
it was right to write a code that will tell physicians what they are allowed to do, what they are not allowed to do while experimenting. And the concept behind it is that even though a single physician thinks that he will, if he will do this experiment, something good will come out to the world, yet he's not allowed to do it in an unethical way. And therefore, the codes are such, or the declarations are such, that make order on who the subjects of experiment are, what type of uh, side effects might appear, what prior idea, idea, scientific idea, is involved in this experiment. Is it new or is it just repetitious and we're just exposing people to discomfort or even to side effects, and many other such considerations, even before one writes the, the protocol of what experiment he wants to do. Moreover, there is a supervision on, ex, on experimenting physicians. They can't do it on their own and be alone in the world and do whatever they think is right. There, there are committees that look into it, that make sure that uh, it's done uh, according to ethical considerations in these declarations. And most importantly, that every experiment has to be done by full informed consent of the subject, contrary to what happened in Nazi Germany, contrary to what happened in some of the experiments in the United States and in other countries in the 50s and the 60s, that is the hallmark of an ethical experiment that the subject has to consent in, by being informed, fully informed of what the process will be. And that is a big uh, advantage of modern medicine and ethics, which in a way came out from these terrible experiments, which weren't done this way. So there's something good that came out of uh, the way it was conducted, not to speak about the substance of the uh, experiment. So I think that there are things that we can learn from these uh, uh, issues. There are things that are still open for debate, and hopefully no one ever in no place in the world will go back to what happened then and will go forward with what we think is the right way to conduct an experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Steinberg, for a wonderful presentation, even if I suppose everyone here would feel very uncomfortable in saying that these kind of presentations can be wonderful at all, of course, because of their content. I guess my question has to do uh, in part uh, with an issue on which you have been uh, uh, touching upon, but, but it has to do also with a fact which is worth thinking, and that is that Germany by 1933 had in fact come up with very specific guidelines on human experimentation to an extent the first guidelines on human experimentations even before of course the Nuremberg Code. In spite of those guidelines which were uh, one could say the product of the evolution of the internal morality of medicine. In spite of that, uh, physicians mm, uh, decide to uh, not only leave those particular guidelines aside, but in fact engage in a type of research that you explained. So I'm wondering what, what you make of that contrast which is not just the contrast between, you know, being a, a decent doctor and being a Nazi, but it's the contrast between being a doctor committed to certain 
ethical uh, guidelines, and on the other hand, being a criminal altogether. So how do we explain this transformation in German physicians um, when we realize that to an extent, from a legal point of view, they were bound by specific norms, and yet ethically, they could not live on a par with those norms. What, what triggered this kind of uh, denial on their part? Just the power of Nazi ideology or something perhaps a little bit more profound that has to do with the logic of science pursued by medicine at some point, a logic which medicine is unable to control or might be unable to control. If the latter case, then we can explain why those kind of experimentations, though not so terrible, might have occurred in other countries and why those experimentations could potentially occur still. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that there are two things. One is the Nazi, which is a really a unique situation, and maybe I can tie it with a broader explanation. But I think in, in the American society in the 50s, 60s, and, and before, and in other countries as well, the problem was that the patient-physician relationship was a paternalistic relationship, which means that the physician decided what is good for his patient or what is good for society without asking any permission or having any uh, control over his decisions. So that if you go by a paternalistic approach, which has an ethical uh, foundation to it, it was uh, the way that uh, medicine was practiced for maybe 2,500 years. Hippocrates writes in his uh, writings, uh, obviously then there weren't hospitals. A physician had a few students coming with him to a house call, and uh, they examined the patient. They prescribed whatever they knew to prescribe. And he tells his students, never speak to the patient about his illness. Ask him about his cows, about his uh, house. You know better than he what is good for him. He doesn't know what is good for him. He knows nothing. Just imagine what did Hippocrates know, even as a physician. But certainly the patient knows nothing. So why talk to him? Why consult with him? Why obtain his, his consent to something? He anyway doesn't know anything. I, the physician, have experience, I learned, I know physiology, I know pathology, I know uh, pharmacology, I know better than any of my patients, and I want for his good. And when I want for his good, he is irrelevant. That was the ethical foundation of a patient-physician relationship. This led to a, an overriding power of a physician over his patients. I remember, I won't mention names, uh, I, I was a medical student uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, at that time, the professor, who was of German origin, and, and I'm not uh, comparing to the German physicians, but the German uh, outlook was, her professor is like a god. You can't argue, you can't ask, you can't say anything. and. He was the head of internal medicine, and I was a student, and I had a patient to present to him, and he wanted to know what his hemoglobin was and what his x-ray showed, and everything related to the physical aspect of the patient. And I happened to mention to him that it seems to me that the patient is a little bit uh, upset, a little bit down, and maybe uh, we should find some way to, to look on this aspect of the patient. He said, forget about it. This is of no interest to us. We are physicians. We are scientists. We treat his illness. All the rest is, is not important. That comes from a paternalistic approach because he thinks that what he knows and what he thinks is important, this is what counts. 
And that may lead to situations of overpowering the, the patient population. And I think that probably was the explanation for Tuskegee and for, uh, for the yellow fever and for all kinds of those experiments that didn't come from an ill ideology. They came from the understanding that I, as a physician, know better what is good for society, what is good for the patient. Once this dramatically changed into an autonomous approach, today in most Western societies, to practice medicine in a paternalistic way is not only unethical, it's illegal. If I attack a patient without his consent, even if I want for his good, I will be sued as someone who did uh, wrong by, by not getting the autonomous consent of the patient. Once the patient is in control, I think it lessens very much the ability and the, the option that a physician will behave in the way that they behaved in those years. Now, why the Nazi physicians were so ideologically impressed by, by the Nazism, I have no explanation. I don't know. Maybe there are people who are more experts than me on, on this particular aspect of, of the personalities in those years. But that's a fact of life, that they were ideologically committed. And that, I think, was not the case in many other countries, even if bottom line was that they were behaving unethically, but not because of such an ideology. Thank you very much for the excellent overview of the, um, the barbarities of the Nazi physicians. I'd like to ask your opinion about an anatomical atlas which was produced by the dean of the medical school in Nazi Vienna called Pernkopf. And there is a new opinion that all the um, wait, let's go back and say that the plates in these atlas, we know, were produced from executed prisoners. Um, not Jewish prisoners, but persons who were executed for all sorts of offenses that the Nazis deemed criminal. But what was criminal under the Nazis could also be resistance and could also be a denunciation of Hitler. The plates were found to have swastikas and SS runes hidden in the plates by the, arti by the artists. It has now been said by a group of medical historians and a group and certain surgeons that these plates are so excellent that following these plates and using them will save lives and will produce a higher standard of surgery. Now, this is like the example which you mentioned of a good outcome from bad practices. But it worries me. Should one accept? this atlas, even with the swastikas <laughs> removed? Or surely there are other alternative, um, I can say, reference works today? But I would be very interested in your opinion of this case. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of this uh, study. Thank you for uh, describing it. Uh, but I think it comes back to the same principal question that I posed. Uh, if there's a good outcome, despite the fact that it was done in a very unethical way, but now it can save lives or help uh, people, should we allow it to use it, uh, even though it came in an unethical way? As I said, if it's already done, we can't go back and undo it and do it in a better way, then uh, 
I would assume that if it can help, uh, we should allow it with the uh, clear understanding that we are not allowing ever to repeat it in this way. There's also another solution, and that is in some of these studies to repeat it on animals or on uh, other ways of studying it in our way, in our ethical way, and see if we can come to the same conclusions and then not use the conclusions that came in an unethical way. That is another option that I know that some of these experiments with the gas and others were done again in an ethical way and they did reach conclusions which were beneficial, although uh, the Nazi experiment did not, on this particular area, reach any beneficial conclusion. So perhaps that is another way. But in principle, this is the question. If something was done in such a terrible way, but it is useful, and now we can save lives, and in principle we are saying because it came in a way that we are not allowed to do it because it's so unethical, should other people continue to die without using the outcome. So I think from my perspective, the answer should be yes, but it is a debatable issue. Okay, thank you. Yes, my question is, was it any opposition uh, to the Nazi uh, ethical uh, attitude in Germany? Any inside argument and voices opposing uh, this behavior? Well, there were isolated uh, oppositions and all of them were silenced or sent to, to camps. I don't recall, and maybe people here who, who studied the, the history know better, Within the medical community, if there were physicians who opposed their colleagues, I'm not aware of it, but uh, that's a good question. How come it didn't happen? Uh, at least a few, get, few physicians say, stop doing it. It's, it's terrible what you're doing. And to the best of my knowledge, it didn't happen. Thank you. Um, I guess I, I'm left still wondering. There are physicians who are doing things that they have been taught they should know they ought not to do, and yet it's still happening. What do you think we can learn in the uh, process by which we are selecting medical students? Or in it isn't just teaching them this is you shouldn't do that, or you should do that, uh, the other. Um, it is, it's more complex than that. How is that still happening when there is a lot of education in, as part of your medical training? Well, I think it's, a, it's an excellent uh, question. To the, again, to the best of my knowledge, there is not yet a method to select students to become physicians that you can assure that they will be ethically driven to, to do their job. I think that most people, if not all, who apply to medical school have, have, have a feeling of a calling. They, they feel that they are going to do something good for humanity or for people or for uh, even individuals. But that is very general. What is good and how to do it good is a more practical question. And it depends on personalities. It depends on background. There are many variables that come into the account. What kind of a physician will I be? A scientist or an ethicist or a combination? And I think that it is very difficult to find the right a barometer, how to choose uh, an applicant that will know that he will be 
an ethical scientific physician. And you're right that uh, there are physicians even nowadays that here and there violate ethical rules despite the fact that either they know or sometimes it's even worse, they don't even know that they are acting unethically because they think that is the right way to do. So I think that the fact that we moved from a paternalistic to an autonomistic uh, approach is helpful because now a, a physician needs the informed consent of the patient and he needs to explain to him and he needs to disclose to him and the patient will guide what he thinks is right for him, which in many aspects will be the ethical decision related to himself. But it's not always the case, and not all physicians are asking for an informed consent, and not all physicians do the process of informed consent in the right way. They, a surgeon gives him a piece of paper with uh, 15 uh, paragraphs that no one can read, and it makes him to sign, and it's as if the patient consented. Obviously, that is not an ethical consent. So this uh, is a very serious question on choosing the right people to become physicians. And there are various methods in various uh, medical schools on how to do it. And I don't know that anyone has the formula that is 100% proof that uh, is yet to be developed. But you're right, uh, there are such cases. I don't think that any of the violations of ethical uh, decision-making are even near to what happened in the 50s and 60s. But still, we don't want even what is happening today to occur. Is there anything um, that you can say about um, Jewish Germans within the medical profession itself? Because I, I know I, that, um, sorry, can you hear me? I don't hear you, no. Oh, sorry, does this work? Can you hear yes. me now? Okay. Um, is there anything that you can say about um, Jewish Germans within the medical profession itself during the pre-Nazi period and then um, either in Germany before the Second World War or um, kind of in like the the diaspora um, of like refugees from Nazi Germany? Because I know that one of the theories that's been posited for why doctors adhered to Nazism at such an exceptionally high rate was because a lot of their colleagues in the medical profession before Nazism were Jewish because of um, like the um, Jewish tradition of like education and the fact that medicine and law were such common career patterns. Um, and so they saw, um, they saw their like Jewish colleagues as competitors. And this was one of the reasons why so many non-Jewish doctors were anti-Semitic. I know that um, for instance, there were Jewish researchers whose work was destroyed by the Nazis. Magnus Hirschfeld conducted some of the first research on human sexuality in Germany um, before the Nazi rise to power. So did, how, like, were Jewish Germans in the medical profession a site of any effective resistance to this mass adherence to an adoption of Nazi ideology? And also, how much was Nazi research, how much did it, like, completely exclude the work of Jewish doctors of, like, the pre-Nazi period and of, like, this contemporary time period just on ideological reasons? The, the, we talked, like, I, um, I heard about how a lot of these studies were deeply flawed for a lot of reasons to the point of being unusable, was ideological exclusion of um, the work of like the rest of the medical profession another part of it like it was in physics in Nazi Germany in the same time period? I'm not sure that I got the, the entire question, but if the question is what happened with Jewish physicians in, in Nazi Germany, so obviously, they were all fired, or, or almost all of them were fired. Some of them were sent to, to camps and, and executed. Some ran away because they felt already that something is going on and left Germany. So in, in practical terms, there were very few Jewish physicians left in Nazi Germany. There were more Jewish physicians in the occupied areas, in, in Poland, in uh, Hungary and in other countries. 
and there are anecdotal stories of their heroism to practice medicine under these circumstances in a humane and in an ethical way, despite the pressure of the Nazis, not necessarily physicians, but the Nazis as such, to press them not to take care of, uh, of uh, patients, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. There are stories about uh, helping uh, women to deliver and, and raise a baby under these circumstances, which were very uh, difficult, and whoever was caught was executed. There were stories about uh, treating the elderly who, were, who couldn't, uh, who weren't uh, sent to concentration camps. They remained in ghettos, and they were treated by uh, Jewish physicians who remained in ghettos, but they are very anecdotal. Most of them either ran away or were killed or were fired, and they couldn't really contribute to a better medicine in those days. for uh, talking with uh, uh, Professor uh, Rabbi St uh, Steinberg for this uh, for this evening. But the good news is uh, that we have um, tomorrow uh, where he will be with us and we'll be doing a lunchtime uh, breakout uh, session as well. Uh, but please join me for the moment in thanking um, Professor uh, Rabbi Steinberg for an excellent presentation to start our conference. Thank you. Thank you. A couple more um, uh, uh, quick announcements, again, to remind everyone that uh, we start again tomorrow for the uh, full day um, uh, symposium. Uh, for those who are uh, going to be joining us physically, it's we're moving from the medical campus to the main campus to the Healy uh, Family Center. So please don't show up here tomorrow, but come to the, um, uh, come to the right place. Um, and um, uh, secondly, just a quick uh, announcement, there's a brochure at the uh, our little flyer at the back of the uh, auditorium in the uh, in the vestibule. That um, if you are impressed by what we're doing here, one thing that Georgetown is now committing itself to doing is trying to raise uh, funds for an endowed chair in medicine and the Holocaust studies. Um, and if you're interested in any way in helping us with that, um, please feel free to uh, uh, contact me either by email um, or by phone. And um, if you know anybody else who'd be interested in, uh, in helping us, um, please, uh, please spread the word. And the uh, papers are in the back of the room. So thank you again, uh, uh, Rabbi Steinberg. Uh, thanks to all of you who've joined us here um, in person. Um, those who've joined us uh, virtually, and we'll see everyone again uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you. <laughs>